be up to is all. Put your mask. But come stand us in the transfer in this room. It, it can't catch anything. Uh, we've had several, as you all know, we've had several delays because of the coronavirus. But we finally are here. Maybe we can get something to do today. Now, one of the first things I want to do is set up the moderator's rule for the Rawlinson Water and Sewer District meeting. This is not our average every year meeting by any means. And we've, uh, when I say we, the district has uh, gone to a lot of efforts to make sure it's done right. Uh, due to the public health concerns as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, the district has consulted, consulted with the legal counsel, the New Hampshire Municipal Association, the New Hampshire Secretary of State's office, and the New Hampshire Attorney General's office to come up with a procedure that ensures that all residents can both participate in the discussion of each proposed warrant article and vote on each warrant article as may be amended. In a manner which ensures every resident can vote safely, each vote is counted correctly, and no resident will lose their right to vote due to the fear of attending an annual meeting of the district in which more than 50 residents may be present. To accomplish this, as a district Moderator, along with council, I have prepared these proposed moderator's rules for this meeting and ask you, as district voters, adopt these rules under RSA 40 colon 4 1. Step 1, which is tonight, deliberative session, annual meeting, Wednesday. June 24th, 2020, 6.30 p.m. This is the deliberative session. American Legion Main Room, Foundry Street, Rollinson, New Hampshire. During the first session of the annual meeting, district residents will discuss and debate, deliberate on each warrant article as part of this, this, as part of this discussion. I will ask for the meeting to approve the final wording of each warrant article to be placed on the unofficial ballot. It can be amended during this period. The paper ballots to be prepared by the clerk for a vote during a second session. Please note, this means that during the first session of meeting, which is tonight, you will only be voting on the wording of each warrant article to be voted on. The actual vote on each article will take place July 1st, one week from today, 2020, at the polling station to be set up in the parking lot across the street from the Legion. And there's a map, a map attached. See map in step two. Nominations of district offices are also made at this meeting. But voting for offices, Article 1, will take place the following week as described in Step 2. Ballot voting on warrant articles. Wednesday, July 1st, 2020, 4, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Voting session, American Legion parking lot across from the Legion County Street, Bronx, New Hampshire. Drive in. Drive in voting. Right. During the voting session, a drive by voting procedure will be set up for registered voters to check in with supervisors of the checklist and vote on all warrant articles, including voting for officers using unofficial ballots. The main reason for this is a lot of people don't want to come down here. They'd be in a, in a crowd. Some can't be down here. The purpose of the second session will be to allow each resident to vote on a paper ballot prepared by the district clerk based on the wording of each article 
born out of a coup during the first <coughs> deliberative session. Voting will follow the procedures of unofficial ballot voting set forth in the RSA 669 colon 54 to 60 and RSA 670 colon 7. This means that your vote on the unofficial ballot that determines whether each article passes or does not pass. Voting for offices will also take place at this time on the ballot. RSA 669.55 requires that you write the name of each candidate or person for whom you wish to vote. In order to win an office, a candidate must receive a majority of the votes for a certain office. RSA 669.60. Now that's the voting procedure. Step three. Announcements of results and adjournment. Wednesday, July 1st, same day as the drive-in voting. 8 p.m. here at the American Legion, main room, County Street, Rollinson. Following the close of the voting, ballots will be counted by the moderator and the supervisors of the checklist, and the annual meeting will be resumed at 8 p.m. At that time, I will read the results of the votes taken on each foreign article, including election of offices. After reading the results, unless there are questions concerning the results or other business to be considered, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. Please note that under these proposed rules, in the event of a motion to reconsider any unofficial ballot is approved, actual reconsideration will occur at an adjourned session of the meeting under RSA 40 colon 10, i.e. at least seven days after the date on which the motion to reconsider was approved with notice of the date, time, and place where the adjourned session is to be held, given by announcement prior to the close of the session in which the motion to reconsider was approved and published in a newspaper of general circulation in the district at least two days before reconsideration. I know it sounds complicated, but I would propose motion by the district. I move to approve the vote rules for Bronxford Water and Sewer Annual Meeting set forth above and to limit reconsideration on said rules and the voting results as provided by RSA 40.10. Second. There's been a, a motion. There's a motion. There's been a second. Do we have any comments? Please give your name. Sure, Jennifer Lentz. I would like to propose that we look at some um, amendments to the proposed process for voting, um, including. Just a moment. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so I'd like to offer a couple of amendments to the pro proposal that you set forth. Um, the first one being that we look at the hours of voting um, to be extended to 11 to 7, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. to allow more folks in the town to uh, participate. The three-hour window would not allow for people in, say, second-shift jobs or folks who are more able-bodied in the morning uh, to attend. So that's one. I don't know how you'd like to, you want me to propose all four and go from there? Put that in, in writing and bring that up here, please. 
So I want to make sure we get it right. Also included in there is a um, request that there be an opportunity for in-person voting as well as um, drive-by voting in those expanded hours. Okay, I understand the, uh, the motion is to the actual vote on for Office of Law and Articles will be take place here, that's what you want, inside this room. As well as drive-by for those who are not in or would, are not able to come in by because of COVID. In the May, okay. The actual vote of the offices and warrant articles shall take place on Wednesday, July 1st in the main room of the American Legion or the gymnasium of the Rollinsford Gray School if the Legion room is unavailable. Due to the COVID-19 emergency, no one attends voters will be allowed into the voting area. The time... Voting should also be made available without, without entering the building. Voting shall take place from 11 a.m. through 7 p.m. Is there a second? I second that. Could you say your name, please? Tom Coons, Stockdale Circle. I'm not sure about the availability of the Legion or the school, to tell you the truth, but do you? Yes. 
Nancy Plivet, 93 John Nance. Whoops, wait a minute. <laughs> General John Sullivan White. Um, and supervisor of the checklist, of course, I would have to be here. And I would like to recommend her amendments great. But like you said, we have one ballot box. We have three supervisors. We have to check them in and check them out. And we have to count the ballots. We can get in more than 10 people here. I would suggest that we move it all in here. If this room's available, if not the school. That's all I wanted to mention. And correct me if I need to make anything. I'll be back. Gallant, if you're concerned about people coming inside, it takes me to step three. Now, if you don't want people coming in, you don't want them being of the potential for exposure, why would you even consider step three, which says if somebody objects to it, then the meeting is adjourned, and we seven days later we come back and we have another meeting. That's just more exposure. Angela Matthews, 437 Locust Street. I support the concept of bringing the voting inside. There are 80 of us in here right now. It would only be 11 people at a time. We have voting booths for 11 people. I would make an amendment that we have one voting station and that it be located inside, which is in also is the most efficient like way. I'm making an amendment to. Is this a different amendment? We got an amendment before us right now. Uh, to your, yes, I'm making a suggestion, which would be, I guess, interpreted as an amendment on, on the motion to have two polling stations. I, I, it would be impossible for us to monitor both those stations, but the, I do believe that the meeting, the voting should be held inside the building, not outside. Drive-by is going to be very challenging for the supervisors to monitor and manage. Bob Deegan, um, one of the reasons why that concept was negotiated actually with the AG's office and the Secretary of State's office is so that people who didn't want to be here in close quarters, that it allowed them to vote and gave everybody the opportunity to not be in close quarters while still meeting the COVID-19 requirements. And that was the whole reason it took this long to get it, because the AG was a little questionable as to how that would go. I'm sure our attorney could tell you more about that, but that was the whole reason the drive-by went through in the first place. So there's no question if you're worried about contamination, you're worried about being around people that might be sick, that's not an issue. They go in, they go out, and that was the process, and that was the idea behind it. If you have two places, now you don't even know who's counting the ballots, how many ballots are coming in. And as has already been stated, the moderator has to be there to keep track of the ballots, checking them in and checking them out. So I don't see how that works, but it's up to you, I guess. Hi, 
Allison Kelly. Um, I was just wondering if you could describe the drive-through process, just some of the logistics of it, um, so we can tell how comfortable we are with that process. Um, will people just drive up, then be handed the ballot? Do you go park? Is there going to be a whole big long line of cars on Foundry if there ends up being a lot of people at once? Um, can you describe how the process will unfold? Essentially, there's a map that shows this parking area. It can accommodate quite a few cars. And the drop up, the pick up of ballots and drop up of ballots is quite a distance apart. Um, and if necessary, we can extend it further up the road so that it'll accommodate quite a few cars. And then people can sit in their cars, fill out their ballot, then move along with their car. Now, I, I have to have a point of order, though. Um, multiple, well, first of all, does that ex answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think it does. Thank you. Okay. We now have multiple conflicting amendments. We have one that says, let's have two places. Okay. We have a, you, there was an amendment to have inside and outside. Is that correct? Inside and outside, as well as an extension of hours. Well, I'm we comfortable. Can't, yeah. Go ahead, John. We can't have two voting spaces because we don't have enough supervisors and we don't have enough ballot boxes. I understand that now that that's been explained. So thank you. Okay. So you withdraw your original amendment to have two voting places and say, let's have one, but have it this way. I withdraw for both two locations. Yeah. And I second. However, with extended hours of that one location from 11 to 7. Okay. Why don't we vote on the extended hours first? Do a little housekeeping, shall we? Back to you. job. I think this drive through is great. Everybody's safe. You can get people here safely at home. And I've had like five or six people that wouldn't come tonight. Because they don't want to come here. They don't want to be in this environment. And you can't blame them. Thank you. Yeah. 
when you volunteer the count? Okay. One take one half and the other take the other half. All in favor of oh. <laughs> All in favor of accepting the change in hours voting from to take place from eleven AM through seven PM. Would you please raise your cup? Okay, yeah, that's well. By far the majority, yes, okay. All right. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to accept the proposed motion by the district for the changes this year to three, to three sessions. You ready to vote for that? Huh? Sir, the next amendment is to um, modify RSA um, 6960 to um, utilize names and offices on the paper ballot like it's called for under the caucus portion of the RSA. So the motion is instead of blank pieces of paper or papers that only have the motion, the warrant articles, it would include the warrant articles and the names of the folks who are nominated and seconded through this evening's nomination process. Could you bring a copy of that up here? Under RSA 669 colon 55 of ballots, it says, however, no names of candidates shall, may be printed on the unofficial ballot. We can't do that. So, you Leopold, Washington Street, Rollinsburg, can you explain to me the difference between an unofficial ballot and an official ballot, and why are we using unofficial ballots for this? Thank you, and it, that, that's a good question. And um, the reason we don't use the official ballot is because that has a declaration of candidacy period, and it lasts about seven weeks before the meeting. So I did look at that as an option, but in evaluating it, you need to have basically a meeting to first vote to adopt the official ballot, and then you have seven weeks to have people declare their candidacy following that procedure, and it would be a really dramatically different from what this district has done in the past. So it, 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 we did this because it was just the easiest, most workable approach under the, all of the circumstances. Caroline Kendall, we indeed do not have the official ballot referendum adopted in the district, which doesn't allow for us to follow that provision in the RSA. However, during the pandemic, the AG's office and Secretary of State's office have made clear that essentially this body can adopt the rules that it wishes to adopt. Although we have an unofficial ballot, that doesn't mean that this body can't approve of the idea of having names on a ballot. The RSA would not allow for a deliberative session or drive-through voting, and yet we're doing that because we're in extraordinary circumstances. And so I would encourage the body here to vote for the process that you want to have.
437 Locust Street. So if we nominate people tonight for essentially five positions, we're speaking their names out loud, and if this were the annual meeting, we would be voting on each of those five positions separately, individually, either in a secret ballot or hand raised. Between now and next week, everyone here and those outside of here would have to know who all those people are. So I'm not certain how memory is going to carry forward from a meeting that is attended by 80 people and a voter base of considerably many more than that. So where do those names get published if you don't publish them on a printed ballot? I am concerned about how that will play forward between now and a week from now when all the names are announced tonight. There will be nominations and people will get uh, nominated for those positions. That's, a, that's another good question and, and we did give some thought to that. Um, the, uh, the nomination process using the unofficial ballot doesn't really mean anything. Of course, normally you do it all here today in this room, but when we're breaking it up, which is consistent with the meeting statutes, it, essentially what you do is you can always have write-ins. Even if someone's not nominated, you could have like five write-ins for someone who wasn't there and wasn't nominated. All that really matters is the name that you write on the ballot. The, the answer to the question of, well, how would someone know? How is someone going to remember? Um, it, you know, people can go, and obviously, the, you know, you, when they enter an election using an official ballot, there's always people holding signs, um, that type of thing. And you can, you can do all that in designated areas. And so that would be one way if that was a concern, just to, just to do that. So it's really, you go in, and it's almost like every person, regardless of what happens here, it becomes a light uh, Tom Coon, Stockdale Circle. So based on this logic, There'll be no names that appear on the ballot at all. No names. Okay. So, is it not the power of this voting body to change that? Yes, it is. So, if we were to put together a motion, as was already presented, to have the names of the folks that are nominated tonight, what would be the what would be the uh, reason not to, if it's been voted by this body, and based on what Carolyn is, is saying as well, that there's the, the, uh, the state is giving a little more latitude now, given these different circumstances. What would be the reason not to have the names vote, listed on the ballot that are voted here at home? Justin Richardson, um, I'm the district's attorney. I've been working with the district for about 10 years now. Um, the, the only reason is, is because there's a statute that says you can't do it. So, I mean, you, you know, I, I, I get where you're coming from, and, and I'm not prepared to say you couldn't do that, but it, where the law says you can't, it, it just makes me uncomfortable. So and, and I think at the end of the day... Hold on just a second. You, but you just said to, you said there's nothing saying you couldn't do it. So other, than, we, other than the statute, I mean, you know, so, so it's a very nuanced issue. Okay. This district has adopted in the past what are called non-ballot voting procedures. Yeah. So normally you do this, and that is a procedure that has been outlawed in towns for over 100 years. The Secretary of State's office has an election manual that's 350 pages long. It doesn't even mention it because I don't think they know it happens. Um, and uh, I've spoken to the Deputy Secretary of State about it, the Attorney General's office. They're kind of, you're, you're in uncharted territory. So, you know, we turn to this and say, let's find a procedure that works. And there's all these laws and even a statute that says the district hasn't adopted an official ballot, use an unofficial ballot. So we're trying to get a model where there are rules and guidelines. And then if any, you know, if you had a vote and it was really close and it was challenged, Someone could say, oh, this statute was violated, and then you'd be stuck with, you know, they would be stuck in court arguing over the result. So the idea is just follow the statute. You know, we did what it said, 
and, and that's simple and you know, essentially unassailable if this was going to end up in court. So, based on what you're saying, and your interpretation of the RSAs and the statute, any person who is voted on tonight, it's almost as though the vote never took place. That's right, because normally you don't you do it all in one meeting, and you don't actually have to. You you could just have those up. You could have those. You could have people discuss things. I mean, you could have people debate about why they want to run for a particular office. But we're trying to set up something so that what really matters is, is just the ballot vote, and that's that's a consequence of that. Is that the nomination process is really superfluous. Kristen Heath, uh, Pine Street. Um, as we just learned tonight, because of COVID, we can make a decision as a body to change the way that we do our voting. And as Jennifer made a motion um, to do that, you said we weren't allowed to do it. And then after our town administrator spoke and clarified that we can, in fact, change that, um, our lawyer, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what your name is. Um, okay. You said that yeah, we could change that. And you questioned whether or not our town administrator had actually made a motion to do that. And Jennifer did. So I'd like to propose that motion be held and voted on now. Second it. Second. Second it. Second. Second. I just want to know if the names are spelled wrong. We're going to throw them out. I second it. Did someone second it? Okay. Who is the maker of the motion? Jennifer. Jennifer. Can we restate the motion? You have my paper. We gave you the You motion. have my paper, but essentially it says that the district will provide ballots with the warrant articles that to be voted on, as well as the name of candidates for the various um, positions. And I would add that it makes sense that we would also have room for write-ins should they be warranted. Um, so that's the motion, that the ballot be provided with the warrants and names of candidates as well as space for writing candidates. Yeah, I can you second that motion? I'm just a little confused though. Who's the moderator here? Okay, but you're not the moderator, Vern. He's the moderator. They spell the name wrong if it's going to be counted? Yes. I, so, Leopold, what exactly is going to be on the ballot? Is it just the warrant articles and then we fill in the candidates? Is it a blank piece of paper and we just um, give it? And what happens if a candidate, we can't spell their name? Um, do we get our vote thrown out because we miss a letter or it's unreadable? I think putting the ballot together with the names on it in a uniform type and right in below it would allow clarity and less guessing on the part of the moderators and the people counting the ballots. Mr. Moderator? Jill Gallant, 432 Spruce Street. I spent about 35 minutes on the phone yesterday with uh, Bud Fitz from the Secretary of State's office talking about um, the moderator's recommendations. And he made it perfectly clear to me that the state of the Secretary of State and the AG's office are only offering these as guidelines. If the members do not like the guidelines, if they don't agree with them, 
They have the right to say we don't agree with them, not to vote for them, and we have the right to make a recommendation that you change them. So that came from Bud Fitch's mouth yesterday. Emily Quark, Stockfield Circle. Can you provide the statue and read the statue in which you, lawyer, can say that it would not count if we put names on the ballot, if that it would be illegal? Can you read that statute to us? And second, um, what prevents us or what legally can be thrown out if we don't have that seven week window? Because we're having a week window, will it be legally upheld? if we have printed ballots with names on them. Does that make sense? Is my question clear? Thank, thank you. And, and just, just to clarify again, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that printing the names on the ballot will, will cause it to be automatically invalid. Um, it, it just, it, it's, just, it's just a violation of the statute. I think if this meeting wants to do that, I, as I said, I think when the gentleman spoke before, I'm, I'm not prepared to say it would be illegal or it would be unlawful. It just it just violates a statute, and sometimes uh, that's you know it happens. You don't like that, but that's um, not necessarily the end of the world. It's only a concern in a really close election. Um, your second question was. Um, if we have printed names on the ballot and we don't have that seven weeks, like you said, will the vote still count? So, so the, the, the reason, oh, oh, the, oh without the, yeah, no, no, that, that, that's fine. You, you'd just be adopting a procedure. The procedure would contradict the statute, but I don't think it's clear that it would be, uh, it, it would be illegal. I'm not prepared to say that it would be. So if that's what the meeting wants to do, I think you could do it. You just have to know that if someone were to change it, you know, somebody could hold up the statute and say, Your Honor, this is what the statute said, that's not what they did, and they'd make their argument and you'd be kind of in court over it. Hopefully the result's clear and that doesn't happen. But isn't that what we're here at this meeting to do, is to say what we want, and wouldn't that be our legal defense in court? I, I, you know, I, I, it's just speculation at that point. I mean, if this is what people want to do, they should vote to do that. If they want to follow the proposed rules, they, they should vote for that. I mean, I really can't, um, I can't guess what's going to happen afterwards. Wendy Chase, Short Street. I think what the people are trying to say back here is that we, yes, we do want to have the names put on the ballots for many reasons, especially the fact that if we're having to drive through, there are people that are not here, there sounds like there's not going to be anywhere that the names are going to be printed so that the rest of the um, residents know who they're voting for. So this is imperative that we do this. The motion's on the floor. It's been seconded, and I believe it's time to vote. Thank you. I'm going to call the question. If you vote for this one, it will be put, have the names written on the ballot. Right? All in favor of doing that, raise it. Pass. Okay, that's passed.
So the, per the motion would be to. Um, I'm sorry to cut you off, but that one is one where I think you'd get in trouble because the statute says right across the board that it's election by majority. The only time it's plurality is when you have adopted the official ballot, which the district hasn't done. Um, I, I encourage you not to do that because um, you could get in situations where, and, and if you think about it, a majority wins, but then you've got the meeting continues, and then someone else, you know, if you just had somebody at 25% of the vote, somebody could move for reconsideration and you'd just be going back over and over again. So I, I, I really suggest that, that you not pursue that one. All right, we will move on. My last one. I will withdraw the motion. Thanks, Bernie. All right, the last um, proposed change or question is about the ballot counting process. Um, the ballot counting process. And um, it says, I would like to propose that as soon as the voting is completed, the polls are closed, the votes will count, be counted in an open setting with observers and the results shall be announced by the moderator. I do not believe the current uh, proposal includes an open setting for the counting of the votes. So that's the motion is to change that to an open setting where the votes will be, the public can do that. By, uh, I mean, that's, that's fine as an amendment. Um, it, it's actually what happens during by statute. The, the, the counting occurs during the meeting. Um, and that's and the reason for, in the third session, posting a, um, a, a, like, like a, a, a time to come back again is so everyone knows when to be there in order to have the, announce, the, the results announced and then a motion, hopefully, to adjourn at that point. So, so I think it's, it's um, the motion's fine, but I'm not sure you, you need it because the moderator would uh, be continue the counting right after the, the polls are closed. All you're doing is announcing this is the voting time, but then the meetings continue. The, the moderator's looking at the results and then announces them at the time of set in the third session. So you Leopold, so when the votes are counted between seven and eight, is there a location and chairs set up like this, six feet apart, for observers to come and watch? Yeah. Thank you. Emily, before the South Hill Circle, where will that be held? Thank you. Part of the process, who is responsible for the counting of the ballot? I see a hand over there, and I've heard moderators. So, the supervisors of the checklist are responsible for the counting of the ballot. Just the supervisors? Just the supervisors, or the supervisors and the moderator? All four. I didn't think moderator can vote, uh, count. Could we get clarification on who counts the vote? Who counts the votes? Who counts the ballots? The double count. Supervisors count the moderator count, right? You get a number to give the ballot vote. Denise Mills, so the street. I thought it was my understanding that the, monitor, uh, the moderator monitors the counting but does not participate in the counting. They don't at the town side. The moderator's role is really as the, the supervisor of the meeting, the announcement of the results. The, the, you know, ideally, you know, the supervisors of the checklist and the moderator are all working together. Um, so it's not really a question that uh, normal 
that normally comes up or I've ever you know, dealt with. It's, uh, it, it's really just one process. The moderator's there. You know, it happens basically during the meeting. It happens in public. So people could come in here and sit and watch. Obviously, you know, the, you can't stand over them or interfere with what they're doing. Um, and, you know, you, the ballots are ordinarily confidential. Um, because, you know, people could read handwriting and stuff like that and do those types of things. So um, that's how the process works. But is the moderator supposed to be counting the ballots with the supervisors? Because the moderator is supposed to be a mutual zone and not supposed to be, I didn't believe it was supposed to be touching. It has to be there, that's all. Right, so you're not going to be counting them, right? right. Mr. Moderator, you're not going to be counting, you're just going to be monitoring. Yeah. Can we well, get there more I can tell you. Hmm? The moderator will be there when they're counted. But you're not going to count. Yes. But you are going to count the ballots? There you go. Are you or are you not going to count the ballots? I'm not physically. I'm going to just monitor the counting of Thank you. This is uh, Pine Street. I just wanted to clarify the time that we're going to be counting the ballots. Is it going to start at a specific time? And is there an end time for this to happen? Because what I don't want to see is 8 p.m. it starts to happen. Because you said between 7 and 8. So I just wanted to clarify that. When are you counting the ballots? What time? Is there a time specifically? And when will the last ballot be counted? Is there under, understood that when it's done, but I'm hoping that there would be some sort of a time frame that we can have as residents to plan for ahead of time.
not the moderator. Right. Right. But the supervisors count, not the moderator. The supervisors are going to count the bells. I'm not going to count the bells. I'm just observing that they are counting it properly. We're just looking for clarification. Thank you. So I will, if, if that is the process, then I will. Can you go up there? Well, I was hoping everybody could hear me because people are concerned about me getting close. I don't think they can hear you. Can you go to the mic, please? Uh, So I can explain the process. When you come, you're, we're going to check you in, and when you leave, we're going to check you out. Then we're going to compare those books. Then we will separate the ballots. Well, we won't need to separate them like we've had in the town. Then we will proceed to count the ballots. Then we will proceed to do our checkoffs. Okay? Very and good. It's going to be Susan. Angela and myself. And you're welcome to watch us. And feel bad for us. Thank you. And thank you for putting the names on. <laughs> We're still outside, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I will withdraw the motion. Thank you. Withdraw the motion about Having, well, I guess there's clarification, I'm sorry, about super, who's supervising the supervisors and what the process is to count the ballots. Are we ready to vote on the rules? Emily Fork, I just have a quick question. Is the location still drive-by voting or is it in the building? That I don't think I understand. Drive by voting. Okay. Are we ready to vote on this? Hi, sorry. Um, Allison Hellady. I'm wondering is everything on a single ballot, or when people drive up, are they handed separate ballots for the different war and articles and elected positions? I don't know if that's been discussed yet. We're just voting on the rules of the moderator right now. We're going to go over all of our articles. Well, I'm wondering about the ballot itself that folks will be handed in their car. Will you be handed multiple pieces of paper, or is it everything going to be printed on a single ballot? The ballot will have the information on there. The warrant. I, I know how, that. How we, how we end up with the writing on each warrant article will be on the voting. Yes, I understand that. I'm wondering if each individual Warren article is on a separate piece of paper or if people are handed just one. On one piece of paper, yes. Except for Article 2, they'll be all on one. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, let's move to questions. On uh, the motion, on the moderator's rules. All in favor. As amended, of accepting the moderated rules for three sessions. Please raise your hand. As amended. As amended. As amended. Okay, that's the majority by far. Thank you. Okay, now we can get into the.
Do we have any nominations for commissioner for three years? Mike Gibbons, 514 Locust Street. I nominate Allison Cullity for a three-year term. Commissioner? Second. I second. Do we have a second? Second. Robert Cavanaugh, 13 Woodland Drive. Do we have any other nominations for commissioner for three years? I nominate Clem Michel. I second the motion. Do we have any other nominations for commissioner for three years? Any other nominations for commissioner for three years? Now we're going one. Any on nominations for a commissioner for one year? Mike Gibbons. I nominate Pat Kaluski for one year term as district commissioner. Second. 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 I did. <laughs> yep. Are there any other nominations for commissioner for one year? Got a say I'd like to nominate Bob Negan for one year. Do we have any other nominations for commissioner for one year? Oh, we'll go on to nominations for district clerk for one year. Didn't you see Al Dion second that? Mike Gibbons, Locust Street. I nominate Kate Preston for one year term as district clerk. Do a second? Are there any other nominations to district court for one year? Are there any other nominations for district court for one year? All right, we'll move on. Nominations for treasurer for one year. Are there any nominations for treasurer for one year? Mike Gibbons. I nominate Jared Lewin for one year term as district tre treasurer. Second. Second. Are there any other, other nominations for treasurer for one year? I nominate. Come over here. I nominate Jessica Sanborn. Do you have a second for Jessica Sanborn? Are there any other nominations for treasurer for one year? Are there any other nominations for treasurer for one year? All right, move on. Vote for moderator for one year. Are there any nominations for moderator for one year? Mike Gibbons, Locust Street. I nominate Jennifer Lentz for one year as moderator. I second. Do we have a second on that? Yep. Are there any other nominations for moderator for one year? Yes, I nominate Ken Shorey. Uh, no, I should not want. Okay. <laughs> no. Once is enough. <laughs> Are there any other nominations for moderator for one year? Are there any other nominations for moderator for one year? Hearing none. RSA 33 and RSA 33B. 
and to authorize the commissioners to issue and negotiate such bonds or notes and to determine the rate of interest therein. The intent of this article is to authorize the district to raise and appropriate the sum of 200000 and the actual amount of each recommendations required. Uh, recommendations required the two-thirds ballot to be approved. This has been recommended by the commissioners and has been also recommended by the budget committee. So we have a, a motion to accept. Motion to accept. Second. Okay. Yes. I have a couple of questions. It was seconded, yes. Are we accepting this as written or are we accepting it for discussion? We're accepting it as a reserve, yes. I would like to ask some questions before you we... You can have questions, sure, go ahead. Um, before we accept it as written. I would like to know how long this long-term borrowing is going to be. It's not stated in here. I would like to know the average cost to taxpayers. I'd like to know who we're borrowing this money from. Is it the bond bank like the town did? And why are the commissioners in this process? Have they already started the proposal and reached out to different agencies? Let's see if we can answer that. Voting for this, you authorize the commissioners to issue and negotiate such notes or bonds and to determine the rate of interest thereon. So that's part of our duty. Okay? We suspect it will be fairly cheap because cost of money these days is pretty low. But that's something that we can't tell you in advance. We're probably going to go with a bank because we have more flexibility but we can't tell you what the final figure will be. Have you started the process? Yes. And have, who have you contacted so far? And North Way Bank. And what is the length? Is it a 20-year bond? Five or a 30-year bond? Thank you. I think that will work. Are there any com other comments? Or Jennifer Lentz, Prospect Street. I have a question about the engineering plan for to be designed. Is it just Willie Street, or is it Willie Street and the connecting roads prospect, I think, was not one that was um, of concern, as well as Locust. So is the project plan for just Willie Street, or other deteriorating lines as well? Would you kindly repeat that, please? Hi, my question is, does this warrant article extend, the, is it just Willie Street, or does it extend to the other uh, streets, prospect locusts that were noted as deteriorating in the prior engineering study? Willie Street is the only street project, okay? Prospect and Locust actually are functioning just fine. So the rumors and stories you've been told that they're ready to die is untrue. Okay. I'm sorry, but I don't think I got an answer to what the expected impact to the average payer would be in my previous question. Do you know that? I'm just a little disappointed because the previous commissioners were able to give us an estimated tax impact of everything, and so does the town. So I would like to amend this, if possible, to put a maximum 
on the long-term borrowing of no more than 30 years. About no more than five. Bring that down here for me. I'll write it down. Anybody, you can, in the meantime, you can speak. Hi, Allison Colody. I'm wondering if the commissioners have already um, signed a contract with the Ted Berry company. They had that was the one company that they had discussed working with. Um, but I was wondering if that actually is a done deal or is it still open for other bids and other methods of pipe replacement? My question is, did you already sign a contract with Ted Berry to do the pipe bursting? Is it still possible to explore other options of just full-on pipe replacement? I didn't know how far along the process you all have gotten. I'm curious. We've talked about it with Ted Berry, okay? They've given us a rough and dirty estimate, nothing firm. We haven't signed any contract with them, and we can't until this passes, okay? Okay. Did, did There's no other company in the Northeast that does this type of work this way. Is that true? Because when I was speaking with Cindy Clevins at DES, she said this has become a more popular method of late. So I was, would be surprised if there was just the one company in Lewiston, Maine that does it. Do you have another company name and contact? I don't, but I could, I mean, I could ask her. I'm just wondering if you did contact DES and discuss or look for other names besides. I know you had said in a prior meeting that this was the one company that came up in a Google search, but I was wondering no. if you did, you did say that at no, the I budget said, hearing. I did a Google search, I found companies in Missouri, Texas, and Washington State, which kind of is kind of far away. Okay, so how did you find this company? Uh, we, I called HTA, and I called, um, I can't remember the other company, and they said, these are the guys that do it in New England. Just this one company? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Jill Gallant, 432 Spruce Street. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember sitting here in a meeting with the town officials talking about, and Caroline was, I think, answering our questions, and it was mentioned that this money had been appropriated in a uh, previous warrant article and voted on by the members, but the commissioners decided that it wasn't necessary. So I think that's true. I think that's what happened. So if you didn't think it was necessary then, why do you think it's necessary now? Why are we voting on it again?
plus two to see if the district will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of 200000 for the purpose of the intent of the article is to authorize the district to raise and appropriate these funds to extend no long to expend no longer than seven years? No. You're going to use it within seven years. Is that, is that what you're saying? I bet the bond is no longer than seven years. Yep. So the only thing that's different is to... Is there a second on the amendment? I just wanted to clarify something that Commissioner Misho just said about the prior commission having not set aside any money for the Willie Street project. Um, that year at the annual meeting, there were two Warren articles. One was for the upgrades to General Sullivan, and one was for upgrades to Porter Well. And especially the Porter Well upgrades were directly related to the Willie Street project because if that is automated, then the water quality will be consistent in the water chemistry and part of the problem with Willie Street is the starting and stopping of the use of Porter Well. I'm sure you're aware of that at this point. I just want to say that it is not true to say that that prior commission did nothing about Willie Street. The two Warren articles were approved, and then you chose not to do them. Hopefully now they will be completed um, over this next year. Thank you. Okay, are we ready for the vote on the long-term borrowing, borrowing issue? And this is, that requires a a two-thirds vote to oh, the amendment. But I didn't get a second on the amendment. Right. Huh? Comments on this, Mike Gibbons, uh, Locust Street. 
I just have a question. I've been to several meetings of the commission and numerous times I've heard in response to why can't we let everybody know, one of the answers has been, well, the answer has been it's too expensive to mail and we don't have anything for um, emails. I wonder if the commissioners, have you resolved that this year by adding money in case we have to mail out to let uh, rate payers know? Something? New England Services Corporation has, for free, going to give us a service called RAVE. And what they're going to do is be able to do blast emails. And I believe they're also going to do automated phone calls. Okay. Does that sort of address your concerns? Um, yeah, the issue at the meeting was everybody doesn't have technology and the mail was too expensive. So I just, I got tired of hearing that because I thought it was a non-issue. It just, it's not that much money. And I want to make sure that it's eliminated from discussions next year. Well, we're going to get the RAVE program or system along with our contract for NESC. So they're going to implement it. And the question about mailing and the money allotted for that? Well, a high percentage of the people in the district will be uh, notified through the RAVE system. Okay, but what I'm saying is the argument before had been that not enough people, you never said it was a high percentage, you said in fact it wasn't a high percentage of people. And the thing like we just had a, an acceptance of this new company, I as a rate pay wasn't notified and I've been going to the meetings. I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, the cell phone and the we will email. look into it. We, we'll try to find, you know, both mailing capacity. But looking into it and having the money allotted isn't we'll the same we'll, thing, Vernon. This is the same we'll thing that's been best. going on in every conversation that's I, been going on. I, I can't commit what I don't know about. There may be other things that have to be paid for. We may have to look, look at sense. other venues, other methods. I then just, take it out of legal fees, Vern. No, I'm, I'm, we're going to take it out of other areas. Okay, so that's a commitment that you will have money in we'll case there's a need? We'll All right. Look into it. No, no, no. That was not what you said. Right. And I want you to clarify this because you always tell me we'll look into it, Vern. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. We will look we'll make every effort to address your, your concern. No, I'd like to make a different I'd like to see if you could make a change to the budget before we vote on it. I the, the budget is an omnibus thing. It's like it doesn't work that way. What doesn't work that way? You have line item They're budgets. They're straight line items. You can move money around. So we, if we have surplus in a particular area, we can probably do that. Which has been my point in numerous meetings, and you said no. There's no specific line item for mass mail. No. Right, but you said we couldn't do it because there wasn't money for it. We will wait until the budget gets approved and see where we have surplus. Why would the budget need to be approved before you had surplus? Because right now we don't have surplus. When the budget is approved, there will be surplus, you're telling me? There could be. <laughs> Only when you have all the expenditures would there be a surplus. You can't tell when you're proposing a budget that there'll be a surplus. Otherwise, you haven't done the budgeting process correctly. Well, I think you can answer anything with that. That's what I got. You said you're going to try. I've been told that before, Mr. Shuri. So do I need to make a motion yes. Yes. that the yes. budget changes and we allot a certain amount of money? And how much money would that be? You're the commission. You can make a decision so we have the capability of communicating with people. I think the email is great. But... Try to shift the money around to take care of that. I mean, 
But more can you say? I mean, I it's don't think you should, should have a figure even on how much it's going to cost right here, right now, right? All I'm asking for is a commitment to change some of the money into a line item. You can create a line item. You can do that maybe next, next year. <laughs> I'm trying to prevent some of the problems that we've had this past year. Bob? How many, how many, um, would you say 570? Not trying to answer his question. Thank you. All right. How many do we have? 570? We have 570 meters. Okay. That's not 570. I understand. I understand that. So it would be no more plus or minus. Okay. So 1,200. How many do we send out a year? Send out postcards. Mel, that's what he's asking about. How much of the mail is we we send up cake? How much of the cards do we send out? I'm not doing billing currently. I can't hear you. I'm not currently doing billing, so I can't answer that question for you. Okay. Okay. So we so how many times a year do we do emergencies? Because so four times. So a couple grand, probably a couple grand. How many? <laughs> Send out a card. You're, you're asking about the question of whether the people that don't have email or what have you, whether they're going to get notice of a water shutoff. Is that what you're talking about? No, not a water shutoff. If there are issues like the, previous, the recent issue of hiring a company, of letting people know. And when I brought it up at meetings, why can't we let rate payers know? It wasn't, and I continually said there's nothing on the website. This issue came up during the virus, and from what I understand, I don't think anyone knew. Well, a lot of things went out the window with that. And then just like this meeting, this concept of the drive-by, um, the attorney spent a long time negotiating that. I understand that, and that's water under the bridge. But, you know, meetings, I'm sure we could send something out to the ratepayers telling them that. But that's going to cost ballpark about two grand a year, based upon what I'm being told here. If the ratepayers want to go with that, go okay. it. I don't see a problem with it. First of all, mm -hmm. who knows about me here this year? <laughs> At any rate, I think it's a good idea. So, are you making a proposal or making an amendment to allocate the two thousand dollars in the no, current? I'm just budget? telling you my personal opinion. Okay. I'm willing to go with that. All right. So I'm not quite sure what needs to be done here. You were making a recommendation with the judge. They said they would try, right? It was okay. just a recommendation from you. Make a motion. Well, the commissioners would have to rearrange the budget now. I don't understand why you can't move $2,000 out of whatever line now and say it will be toward that, because you can move it back if you don't need to, if the email works for everybody. I just don't want the, the excuse to be what I heard for a year, which was a non-excuse. I didn't take it then, and I don't take it now. And I don't take the condescending tone of Vern telling me I'll look into it. I've been mocked at these meetings. I've been threatened to have the cops called on me. And Vern, I don't appreciate it. I think sorry, probably, you probably ought to order pushing that point. They've already said that they're going to make an attempt to get these more information out. So I think that's about as far as we can go. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Next. Hi, um, Allison Kelly. So the budget was drawn up and approved or recommended by the Budget Committee and the commissioners prior to the hiring of the New England Service Company. Um, so I'm wondering how that $133,000 contract fits into this budget. Um, 
So did you have to cut other things in order for that um, large amount to make its way into this budget? even prior to it having been approved by the district members, because um, there wasn't an approved budget when the commissioners made that move. Well, I'll give you a little background on that if you want. That'd be great. All right. What happened was, with this whole COVID-19 bone is going on now, which affected everybody, I was talking to DES. We talked about the many problems we were having at the plant and covering everything we had to cover. And I asked some specific questions. They came back and told me on Manning what they suggest we should cover. Yeah. And we had to talk to an attorney to decide how we can handle that situation. And that's what we did. We made some adjustments, some realignments, and that's where some of the money is coming from, from those realignments. Okay? Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Hi, right, Wendy Chase from Short Street. I just um, am curious, the attorney, you said that the attorney had to uh, negotiate for the drive-through voting. What, what did that cost and who were you negotiating with? And also, I don't understand why if we've got 560 rate payers, why you just can't ask people, would you like mail, email, or a phone call to be able to be notified of what's going on? How simple would that be? Put it in with the bill that you're sending. That's it, my comments, thank you. Was it just, I think it's a good idea, all right? I think it's a good idea, and it's relatively easy. Are we ready to vote on the operating budget? Hold on a second. The wording of the operating budget. No, or you have one more. So in this budget, how much is, uh, well, first question, how much was spent total last year on Legal fees, how much was paid last year? It was 20, you have no idea? 20? You have no idea? You don't have any idea? What's your 20. vague idea? 30,000? How much is in the budget this year? Your proposed budget for legal fees this year. I can't hear you. That's another twenty. Twenty thousand. It's in the budget. I'd like to amend this budget uh, and add an additional five thousand to that number, bringing it up to twenty-seven, five eighty-five. Um, and to have that amount of money, uh, the additional money used for the, for 
for the mailing, which will probably occur more than once a year. I agree. We should have been notified of that. The rate payers should have been notified. We should have had a meeting, honestly. Can I put that in writing, please? Sure. Do, Do we have a second? No, I just want a second. I'm going to read it. I want to put it in writing and bring it up for a full week. We can't, we cannot change a line item. No, but you can change the total amount. Right? Yeah, you can do that. Bottom and I think if, if, the, if the folks here are in agreement, that's what that money should be paid, should be used for. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't mean we'll spend it on that. Yeah, I'll hold it out. I'll hold it out. So when you chase again, I think I walked away before my question was answered about the fees. We paid an attorney to negotiate, to drive through, to vote, when this is something that's part of the COVID relief. So what did that cost us, and why did it have to be negotiated? Who did you negotiate it with? The attorney did not negotiate the drive by. He researched it, consulted with other people, including the Attorney General, Secretary of State, the Municipal Association. That takes a lot of time and research. Negotiation well, that was part. the word that was used by... I know, that was wrong. Uh, it was wrong. It was research. to the legal questions. Um, I seem to recall at the first virtual meeting, the commissioners, I thought, signed to go with a different attorney, um, something to do with a conflict of interest, but I think you're still the original attorney that had been with the district prior to that, um, that paperwork being signed. I'm just wondering if we can, why are you back? No disrespect, I'm just curious. It just seems strange because I remember that meeting happening. All right, now we've got a motion to change the bottom line of the budget from 722.585 to 727.585. And it's to add the post. And it 
Everybody understand that? Say it a little louder. That last part. Are we ready to vote on that? Can we read it again, please? Okay. You need a second? No. Jill Gallant. Um, I just got a copy of this budget. I'm confused because there's no ex there were no expenditures for police in the uh, year 2019. I know that you paid for police to come down and uh, make sure that the peaceful demonstrators didn't hurt anybody. So there's nothing budgeted for police, but yet you've already spent money for police in 2020. Why is that not in the budget? We're going to vote on the change of the bottom line. Bottom line was 722,585, and we're going to change it to 727,585 to add for postage and mailing. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Hold on. Yes. I'm going to do that again. Yes. This is just for the bottom line, not for the whole budget. Change it. Right? All in favor of the motion to change the bottom line to 727585. Thank you, Captain. I guess we got it No, I guess we get. the lawyer's going to have at home with his wife about him. I believe a couple questions have already been asked that weren't answered, such as Allison's, why is the attorney, why did we have a... a well, I was just wondering why the conflict of interest... No, uh, uh, Okay. Well, as I stated earlier, I was just curious about the lawyer and the conflict of interest that apparently was there a few months ago, but I guess went away. Did we dissolve the relationship with Shaheen and Gordon to now go back to the New Hampshire water law firm? No, it's well, not. It's actually not complicated. Real simple. Different lawyers, if you've hired lawyers before, have different specialty areas. And that's it in a nutshell. When you're negotiating a contract, for example, we'll say he was my lawyer, okay? And all of a sudden, I get into a car crash with her, and it, he's now got to pick. He said, wait a minute, she's also my client. You can't have the same attorney for multiple clients if there's a conflict. And frequently there is a conflict because they might know somebody, there might be something else going on. There's neither hire nor fire. We didn't hire or fire. Different attorneys have different things. I use several different attorneys all for different things in my businesses. And it's not that one is better than the other, it's their specialty area, and that's what it is. His specialty area is what he's doing right now. That's why we hired him. Can I ask 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, I didn't understand that, that the Shaheen and Gordon firm was brought on for a particular purpose. Thank you. Is the Water and Sewer District eligible, like other municipal government agencies, for COVID-19 funding? I know the school is getting COVID-19 funding, and maybe the town. I'm wondering if this body is able to get COVID-19 funding to offset some of our legal fees for the, this meeting and the drive-by voting. Basically, the sewer district is in a support function. The water sewer district is a support function during this whole COVID-19 to make sure that your facilities are running, your water was there, so the health and safety was kept on going. If we expended money above and beyond, we probably won't qualify. We haven't spent any money above and beyond. It's all within our normal operating expenses. So I say no to your answer. Your question. And since this... Um, official budget has not been passed by voters, but is being expended currently. Is it being expended currently? Mm -hmm. So we're still running on money left from 2019? Okay, because we have not authorized the commissioners to spend the money in this budget, correct? RSA 32 provides that if a budget is not accepted until the new budget is accepted, you spend at the same rate and amounts you did in the prior year. And that's mostly because we pass our budgets in March, but our fiscal year ends in December. So we've got a three month gap. The basic rule is pretend you're still on the same budget. Okay? RSA 32. So since this meeting has been pushed back and voting has been pushed back until July, we've been spending from January to July on the same rate we spent in 2019. Correct. Thank you. Are we ready to vote on the... All right. Does the default budget need to be in there if this fails? It's not an SB2. Okay. Just thought it has. A default budget only occurs in the community that has passed SB2. Are we ready to vote on the work? <laughs> yeah, are we ready to vote on the wording of the budget? It would be in the new wording is to authorize the commissioners to raise the appropriate the sum of seven hundred and twenty five thousand twenty seven thousand five hundred and eighty five dollars for general municipal operations, which is the operating budget. This article does not include appropriations contained in a special or individual article addressed separately. We ready for the vote? Vote on the wording. All in favor? Please raise your card. That's passed. Okay. Now.
vote is required. This is recommended by the commissioners. It is not recommended by the budget committee. If you look over there, you'll see that part of that is in red. And the reason for that is, when I, when I developed this, I was just grabbing boilerplate from DRA, and it had that the commissioners would be agents. I didn't feel comfortable with that, and so I shared my discomfort with the budget committee, and I said, what we really need to do is take out that, that wording in red, and let the legislative body, which is you, decide how to expend that money, and not the commissioners. That's why it's there. And I would ask someone to make an amendment to the wording to strike, to name the commissioners as agents from this Warren article in wording. I have a question. So you're putting up a Warren article, and you want us to amend this warrant to take out, to name the commissioners as agents to expend. So you want the, the voters here to have the power to tell you how to spend that, that money. Is that correct? So let me ask you a question. Why wouldn't you ask the voters how to spend the $133,000 on the contract you signed? What's the difference? Uh, it's within our governance authority. It's under the contract. This is the foreign article. This is separate. Yeah, I understand that, but you're, you're looking for us to give you, you know, to approve $25,000. Well, I think it's important. It's a reserve fund, not part of the budget. No, I understand right? that. I understand that. But, it but I, it's I, just I, like the town operates that way right now. They put money into the fire department for new trucks that may come up, or new equipment that they need, and then when they appropriate it in the budget, I'll put it in the budget, they'll say we'll draw from the capital reserve fund. If I'm not mistaken, though, when the fire department or the police department needs a new cruiser or new equipment, those things generally find their way onto a warrant. Is that not correct? Yes. So why wouldn't that $133,000 contract find its way onto a warrant article? It's not a capital item. Does it necessarily need to be a capital item? So it needs to be a capital item to be a warrant. But that's not a capital item. It's, but it's not a capital I. It's not. It's not a capital I. It says sewer capital reserve. Capital is part of the title. I guess it goes back to the question, though. Why wouldn't you have brought that large contract to the voters? Why would you not have brought that to the voters? Because it's within the authority of the governance of the commission. But that's not what I asked you. My question is, why wouldn't you bring it to the voters? Why wouldn't you want them to have a discussion about it? It's a lot of money. Do you not know the answer? $133,000. This is $25,000. Okay? Except that it's part, but you see, you're asking us to, to vote on these things to send them forward. I get that. But you bury this $133,000 elephant in the, into the, the operating budget. So there's no discussion. Nobody can talk about it. This is different. This is different. Thank you. What we're doing here right now with this capital warrant is putting money aside to offset costs, future costs, to the district, either the water or the sewer. There are two items here. Just right. look at it. When you start talking about what we are allowed to do as commissioners, doesn't call the description here right now. Okay? What you're talking about, what the commissioners did was something they had to do not to meet certain requirements. Period. We're allowed to do that. To keep this thing safe for all of us. 
That's what we did. And it's like, you know, you can't compare this to this. This is what money is signed for. A specific facts later on downstream. What you're talking about something that doesn't take this at all. Hi, Jill Gallant again. Um, I can only relate to this in the fact that I managed uh, condominium associations for 20 years. And most of them, not all of them, but most of them have a capital reserve budget. I don't know if the state of New Hampshire requires a percentage of your condo dues go to that reserve. I know the state of Florida does. I know it's not the budget committee's recommendation that we have reserves, but I find it, I just find it irresponsible that there are no reserves in this water sewer district budget, that there's no money anywhere in capital reserves. So I guess for once I would have to probably agree with the commissioners that we need a capital reserve. Okay, wait a minute. The, the budget committee Speaking in the microphone. What's in red. The microphone. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, he didn't say. But so you're, the budget committee only objected to you, to the commissioners having control over it. Okay, but I, again, I urge everybody to vote for a reserve budget. Mr. Moderator. I'd like to ask Jennifer Lenz, Prospect Street. I'd like to ask that the word village be struck from this warrant article um, to represent the entire district, not just the village district. That's what it's called legally, a village district. It's not a district. Then I would recommend that we say Rollinsford Water and Sewer District versus Village District. As you pointed out to me, Vern, Village District does not represent where I receive my sewer and water, and I want to make sure that this covers the entire district. Okay. Will you make a motion to amend Village District to Rollinsford Water? I will. I will make a motion to amend the wording to now read to see if the Rollinsford Water and Sewer District will vote. Second. Second.
But you didn't you Where did you come from? You didn't clearly <laughs> state what the article was going to be, Mr. Monterey. Um, my question was, do we have for this a rate increase for the payers? Do we know how much it's going to go up for those in the sewer district? And then the same question for the next article. question was 43 bucks and some change is what it comes up to for the sewage. A year or a quarter? Per customer a year. Okay, back to back to the amended capital sewer capital reserve fund. All in favor of that? Thank you. No questions? 
All right, this is just the same writing as the uh, capital, sewer capital reserve fund. We're going to change it to read the same as that. To see if the Bronson Water and Sewer District will vote to establish a water capital reserve fund under the provisions of RSA 35 colon 1 for the repair, improvement, replacement of water infrastructure and to raise the appropriate sum of 25000 to be placed in this fund. That's what it boils down to. We're we ready for the vote. All in favor, say aye. That's passed.
Hey, Vern. Vern, how do you shut this off?